Okay. All right, so you're unmuted on here. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming out uh, to Yen's talk. And I'm going to have uh, Chris Stark come up and introduce Yen's. But just as a reminder, we are doing a lunch. I think, are you free for lunch after this? Yes, awesome. So anyone that's in person, we're just going to be at the cafe over here if you want to grab lunch of us. And I think you have some availability this afternoon if anyone wants to meet one on one. Yes. So yes. just let us know. But uh, I'll give it over to Chris. <laughs> Thanks. So it's our pleasure to welcome uh, Jens Kammer today. Uh, Jens is a postdoc up at uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, and uh, where he's working with the direct imaging, high contrast imaging group up there, uh, Marshall Perrin, Remy Simmer, Laurent Puello, et cetera. And he's quickly becoming an expert in all forms of high contrast imaging. So long baseline interferometry, uh, aperture masking interferometry, and um, coronography as well. Um, he obtained his PhD from the Australian National University. His master's was at ETH Zurich, and he is the lead for the instrument science team for the LIFE initiative. So if you're interested in future, future missions, uh, I, I uh, encourage you to uh, meet with uh, Jens this afternoon. Um, Jens has been uh, very successful in uh, JWST as well. So you may not realize it, but Jens was behind the scenes working on a lot of the chronograph and aperture masking uh, commissioning for Webb. Um, and a, a lot of the reason that those modes are working now is, is because of, of Jens. Um, he also is PIing two geo, cycle one geo programs on JWST and is involved with many others as COI. I don't know how many, but it seems like on all of them. Um, and he also has a successful PI program for the LT sphere. Um, so today we're going to get a peek at all of these different types of uh, high contrast imaging techniques um, from JWST to far future. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris, for a nice introduction. Um, I'm going to try to reduce this uh, Zoom window here on the screen. Okay, should be better now. Perfect. So, yeah, um, thanks a lot for the nice introduction and also for inviting me to talk today about the uh, high contrast imaging of exoplanets. Uh, so I want to take you on a journey from Jovian planets to Earth analogs, basically starting with the new James Webb Space Telescope and the observations of young gas giants that we are currently doing with JWST, then moving on to Roman and the first observations in reflected light of some more mature gas giant planets, and ultimately also moving on to our simulation work on future missions uh, that will hopefully eventually be able to directly detect and also characterize Earth analogs in the habitable zones of nearby stars. So this nice background image here that's going to accompany us throughout the talk is probably known to all of us. Um, it's showing a, an image of the Earth taken from more than 40 astronomical units away by the Voyager 1 spacecraft. And I, I think it illustrates pretty nicely what we are getting in direct imaging of exoplanets. We get observations of unresolved point sources. We can study their brightness. We can study their color, maybe their spectrum. But in the end, it's always going to be a point source. In the case of our own Earth, it's, it's a very blue color, mostly because of the Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere. Um, but yeah, in the end, it's going to be point sources. And I think this image also illustrates nicely where we are hoping to go with the field in the far future. We basically want to study um, these Earth-like planets uh, around other stars and hopefully search them for signs of life. So on this, on this uh, far future goal, we are right now uh, here at the top, JWST. So I'm going to report a little bit on our results from the commissioning observations and also the early release science program on high contrast imaging of exoplanets. Um, this will be probably two thirds of the talk. And then I'm going to move on to Roman, uh, which will appear for the first time into the reflected light regime and detect mature planets. Um, and then finally move on to LUVEX uh, or whatever you want to call this kind of future flagship mission now <laughs> um, that will uh, yeah, be able to directly study Earth analogs and the habitable zones and study their atmosphere for signs of life. Now, before we dive into the JWST results, um, I wanted to highlight a bit what we're actually doing in the field of high contrast imaging and what the main challenges are that we have to, to deal with. So for that, I'm showing you this uh, famous movie of the HR8799 exoplanetary system. Um, it's a system with four gas giant planets, and I think you can probably all uh, make them out very easily because you can see them orbiting their host star as we have observed the system throughout time. So I think that's like a really fascinating uh, movie to look at. Um, and 
the, the two major challenges that we have to overcome with these uh, high contrast observations are basically angular resolution and contrast. So if you look at the, the separation that we uh, find between these uh, faint exoplanets and the host star, which is here located in the center of the image behind this black disk, it's only a few hundreds of milli arc seconds. So we really need the biggest telescopes that we have both in space and on the ground to be able to resolve these scales. Just for, for reference, similar as if you glue your smartphone to the antenna of the Empire State Building and try to observe it from right here where we are. <clears throat> The second challenge is uh, the contrast between the faint companion and the host star. Um, so for these young gas giant planets, we're talking about something like 10 to the minus 5. So that's approximately like seeing a little birthday candle next to a lighthouse. If you go to Earth analogs in the habitable zone, like the ultimate goal in the further future, it's more like seeing a firefly next to the lighthouse. So it's another few orders of magnitude more difficult. Um, and one of the most classical pr uh, principles to basically suppress the, the, laugh, the, the, the light from the host star and make these faint companions visible is uh, chromography. And this, this image here is just illustrating in a very uh, easy principle how that works. So you basically just take a, a disk to block out the light of the host star. It's an idea that goes back to the 1930s when uh, Bertrand Leo was observing the corona of the sun. Now, of course, by today, the field has evolved a lot and the optical elements is a lot more complicated than just a simple disk, but it's still kind of the same principle and um, that you try to suppress the host star light with, by blocking it out with, with, with some kind of uh, disk or optical element. Of course, this only uh, is part of the story. Um, there's actually still a lot of stellar leakage light after the coronagraph. And I'm showing you here one example of a JWST observations just for illustrative purposes. So on, on the left side, you can basically see um, the observations of a, of a planetary system with a host star, of course, after the coronagraph. So there's still a lot of stellar light leaking over and leaking around the coronagraph. And in order to make the faint companion uh, on the right visible, we have to use PSF subtraction techniques and somehow um, get, get rid of all of this uh, residual uh, stellar spectrum, what we sometimes call it. And with JWST and also other space-based uh, telescopes, we have really two different methods to do this. Um, the first one is sometimes called angular differential imaging, or sometimes also called role subtraction. Uh, and the other method is called the reference uh, differential imaging. Um, and the idea behind those techniques is basically that um, in, the, in the role subtraction or ADI technique, you observe the same, the same system twice. But in between those two observations, you slightly roll the telescope. With web, we can do roll angles of about up to 10 degrees. So it's not a big roll angle, but at least a little bit. Um, and so the, the host star in the center of the image will stay at the same position, whereas the planet will move slightly in position angle. And so if you subtract those two images from each other, you can uh, subtract off the, the, com the, yeah, the, the leakage light from the host star while still making the planet visible because it moved uh, on the two images. The other, the other uh, concept or yeah, method is called ref reference differential imaging. And the idea there is that you simply observe a different target, which doesn't have any companions. And then you use that to get an estimate of this uh, speckle halo from the from the host star, and you subtract that from the science image and make the planet visible. So we will we will hear about those two different approaches multiple times throughout the talk. So just try to keep in mind what's the difference and how they they roughly work. So I'm I'm briefly gonna um, illustrate uh, why we care about direct imaging and uh, kind of the unique science that we can do with that. Um, so this is a very famous plot that is often shown in exoplanet talks, which shows uh, uh, some of the known exoplanets in orbital period versus mass space, um, color coded by the detection technique. Now, as you can see, there's only a very small amount of planets that were discovered with imaging. And you might ask, why do we care about that? Because RVs, radio velocities and transits, they detect so many more planets. Now, this plot nicely shows that uh, imaging is probing a very unique parameter space in, in, uh, in uh, here, which is the, the planets at moderate to wide separations that are really hardly or completely inaccessible by other techniques, um, because those techniques are um, yeah, basically biased towards observations closer to the star, where the transit probability is high. Uh, and also, if you want to do radial velocity observations and detect planets at long periods, you just need very long temporal by baselines of observations. So at some point, it becomes unfeasible. Also, um, we hope that in the future, we can 
push these direct imaging observations towards uh, higher contrast, so basically towards smaller planet masses, and really starts to be able to probe the, um, the regime where true Earth analogs are located, kind of, you know, somewhere here in the plot, um, to be able to detect these true Earth analogs, because that's really hard for RV and transit techniques, since they are limited either by simply the transit probability, which is not very high at uh, separations of one AU, or um, also in RV, you start to be limited by astrophysical noise from the host star, stellar speckles, uh, stellar vari variability, and it's really difficult to beat this noise down um, and get to um, observations of lower mass planets. On the other hand, direct imaging is really good to study young systems and to study the formation of exoplanets. Um, the reason for that is, of course, when a planet forms, um, it gravitationally contracts, and uh, this energy is released as heat energy so that the planet becomes very hot and self-luminous. Um, and so it becomes easier to see because the contrast between the star and the planet will be lower. And, and this kind of plot here shows some evolutionary models of uh, exoplanets, brown dwarfs and low mass stars. Um, oh, here's the pointer. Yeah, and it basically uh, illustrates that younger objects are, are brighter and, sorry, and have a, a lower contrast between their hosts so they're easier to observe for us. Um, and this is again very complementary to, to other techniques like transit and radial velocity techniques, which uh, are better at looking at more mature systems where the, the star is less active, where the star is having a slower rotation period. And so again, this gives you kind of a, a complementary um, approach to this the exoplanet science. All right, now that we have seen what we can do with the direct imaging technique, I, I think it's time to yeah, show some results from JWST. Um, of course, uh, has been successfully launched and commissioned uh, during the first half of this year um, and uh, started science operations in July. And of course, it's been a very exciting time over the last one and a half years at Sci uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm sure it's also been exciting here at, uh, at Goddard um, to see how this observatory is really outperforming the, the pre-launch predictions and doing uh, really amazing science already in its early days. So with JWST, we have a whole suite of instruments, and basically you can do observations of faint companions with all of those instruments. Um, I group them here into four different modes. Um, the two major ones that are actually designed for high contrast imaging are chronography and aperture masking and bathrometry, which are also the modes uh, where I've been involved with the commissioning of, the, of, the, of these uh, observations. Um, then there's also integral field spectroscopy, which I will touch upon a little bit because we've done some observations in the early release science program uh, with this mode as well. And of course, you can do classical in, uh, classical imaging um, over the whole uh, wavelength uh, range accessible by JWST. But um, for reasons of time, I will I will not uh, go into too much detail about that. So let's get started with uh, the most classical approach with chronography. So this is very similar to what I've been showing you in the introduction. Um, you can do that with both NERCAM short word of five micron uh, and MIRI long word of five microns. Um, and uh, yeah, in NERCAM, we have a couple of different coronographic masks, five in total. Um, the more traditional ones are these, uh, are these round masks here, which are really similar to this kind of uh, concept of the disc that blocks out the whole slide that I have shown you in the, in the introduction of the talk. Um, but we also have two of these bar masks, um, which basically have uh, a little bit less uh, extent in the lateral direction. So the idea is that you can achieve a better uh, resolution, a better inner working angle in the lateral direction by using these bar masks. But that's something that we still have to uh, investigate a bit with, uh, with some of our GTO programs. Then with MIRI, um, the, the majority of the, of the coronograph science is done with a four quadrant face mask. Um, so that's basically a face mask in the pupil plane for those of you who know a bit more about the, the technology. And it has phase shifts of zero pi and zero pi in the four quadrants. So in the center of the image, you basically get a destructive interference. Uh, so you, that you basically null out the host star because you have light that is phase shifted by zero pi, zero pi um, that's uh, interfering. And then companions that are somewhere um, in one of the quadrants will, will still be visible. Um, and at 23 microns, we have also a more traditional Leo, uh, Leo mask, but this one has actually been rarely used so far for any observations because it's a really, really big mask. And basically most of the known exoplanetary systems are all kind of interior to this mask. So it's not 
not been uh, used uh, a lot so far. Another thing that I think is worth showing here is the, the Leo stops so or the, the pupil plane masks that we are using for these different coronographs, um, especially for NERCAM here. Uh, it's, it's a very aggressive uh, Leo stop design, which only lets through about 20, 25% of the light um, to basically make sure that you only get the very nice and smooth uh, areas of the primary mirror and kind of avoid these uh, regions where you have the gaps between the segments or where you get some additional diffraction from the, the secondary spiders. And the idea behind that is that by using only like kind of the, the best regions of the mirror, you can gain better contrast. But of course, on the other hand, you will lose some throughput, you will lose some sensitivity to faint sources by throwing away a, a large portion of the incoming light. With MIRI, this is a little bit more uh, yeah, con, uh, conservative design and has a little bit more throughput because uh, the wavelengths are longer, so we don't care too much about this scattered light from the mirror gaps. So it's finally time for some uh, JWST data. Uh, so this is uh, on-sky data from our early release science program on the high contrast imaging of exoplanets. Uh, these are observations of HIP 65426, which is a well-known exoplanetary system with a companion at about 600 milli arc seconds separation. Um, so on the top, you can see NERCAM, our NERCAM data, uh, and at the bottom, uh, our MIRI observations in one of the filters uh, with one of the four quadrant face masks. Uh, the pointer is there. Um, so the left-hand image shows the unsubtracted PSF after the coronograph. And then once we do PSF subtraction with either this uh, ADI or roll subtraction technique or the RDI technique, you are able to see this uh, exoplanet companion popping out actually at a very, very high signal to noise ratio. Um, if you have been working in exoplanet science for a while, then such a high SNR on an exoplanet will hopefully amaze you. <laughs> um, I think something that's worth mentioning here is if you look at this uh, role subtraction uh, with MIRI, you can see that here the detection is not so good actually. And the reason for that is um, here we're looking at a longer wavelength, about 11 microns or so. So the, the separation of this companion in, in terms of uh, lambda over D is, uh, is a lot smaller. Um, and since we only have a 10 degree roll angle, which is actually not a very big roll angle from the ground, people do like maybe almost about 180 degrees um, if they observe for the whole night. Um, so we have a really small roll angle and we get a lot of self-subtraction on this very close in companion. And that's why the detection is kind of not so good with uh, with roll subtraction at the long wavelength here. And that's really where you want to use the, the reference uh, star differential imaging technique to get a better detection. Uh, also, what we have done as part of the ERS program, we have developed a data reduction pipeline, which is publicly available on GitHub and which is called Space Clip, and which basically allows you to go from the raw James Webb data to these uh, finally PSF subtracted images. Um, and also lets you explore the properties of, if, of, your, of your companions if you detect any, lets you derive contrast curves and detection limits. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in uh, either using that or collaborating on that, feel free to check it out on GitHub or get in touch with, with us uh, from the ERS team. And speaking about contrast curves, that's what I wanted to show next. Um, so basically uh, with, with NERCAM, we get down to about contrast of 10 to the minus six. Uh, at the, in the background limited regime, outwards of two arc seconds or so. Um, and then inwards of that, we are kind of limited by the throughput of the coronographic mask. Um, but at least for me, the, the most uh, fascinating plot is the one that shows the, the, the detection space in terms of uh, separation and mass limits, because that really shows that with these observations, we can probe uh, down to masses below the mass of Jupiter. And that's really um, a game changer in the field. Uh, basically, all of the known exoplanets that we have directly imaged so far, they have masses of more than two Jupiter masses, often oh, sorry, often uh, actually between eight to 12 Jupiter masses. Um, and this is really the first, first time where we can uh, probe a significant number of targets into the, the sub-Jupiter mass regime and be able to detect really true analogs of the gas giant planets in our own solar system. Uh, with MIRI, the contrasts are a little bit uh, lower, but also you have to, uh, to take into account that at longer wavelength, the contrast between the star and the planet is also not so high. So if you look at the mass limits, uh, you still get down to about um, one Jupiter mass or so, um, which is 
very, very deep observations for this kind of long wavelength. People have tried very hard from the ground to detect exoplanets at 10 microns, and they have not been able to do it. And they have also not been getting close to really such deep mass limits. And it's been the first time that we were able to directly detect an exoplanet at such a long wavelength. Um, finally, uh, before we move on to the next mode, I also want to give a brief comparison to observations from the ground. Uh, so this is from a recent paper from William Thompson, who has have been looking at this famous HR 8799 system from the beginning with the four uh, gas giant companions, uh, which are shown in this plot here. Um, and this is uh, data from, from Keck in the L prime band, so that's around 3.8 micrometers. Um, and basically they have five epochs and each of these epochs they observe between four and five hours. So it's really, really deep observations um, in, in this L prime band. And if you compare that to what we can achieve uh, with, with JWST, we really get about a factor of uh, yeah five or so deeper in contrast in just about a tenth of the exposure time. So it's really, uh, at least in these regimes where from the ground are dominated by background from the atmosphere, by thermal emission from the atmosphere, with JWST, you're at least a factor of 10, 20 better than, than anything that has been possible before from the ground. All right, so the, the next mode that you have on web, which is uh, dedicated actually to high contrast imaging observations, um, is uh, aperture masking interferometry uh, on NIRIS. Um, although this is kind of limited to a very narrow or a rather narrow uh, wavelength domain between about three and a half and five microns, but it's still kind of an interesting domain which is hardly accessible from the ground and which can tell you a lot about um, yeah, molecules like methane or CO, which are very abundant in these uh, gas giant exoplanet atmospheres. So the, uh, the idea behind this uh, mode is that you do interferometry with JWST and that you use this uh, pupil mask, which is uh, shown on this plot here, um, which basically splits the mirror of James Webb into a sparse interferometric array with seven smaller apertures. And then you can do interferometry with JWST and you get down to smaller resolutions because you get to the Michelson diffraction limit of interferometry, which is only about 0 0.5 lambda over D. Whereas the coronographic masks in NERCAM that we have seen before are more like a yeah in a, a full width half maximum of a few lambda over d maybe two to three lambda over d, so this is basically giving you better angular resolution than the classical chronography. Yeah, I don't want to go into too much detail to explain how how the mode works. Um, so I think I'm just going to continue with what we have uh, seen in the commissioning observations. So in commissioning we observed the AB Dorado system, which has also a, a well-known uh, stellar companion at a, a separation of about 300 milli arc seconds or so, um, and a contrast of about 1.6%. So you can see this yeah, popping up, up as a clear detection here in our commissioning observations, observations in just about one minute of integration or so. And uh, the plot on the right shows our detection limits. So here I want you to focus only on this uh, light blue line down here, which is showing the nearest uh, AB Dorado data. Um, so we got down to about seven magnitudes of contrast. It's, of course, by far not as deep as you get with chronography, but you have to keep in mind it's at much smaller um, separations, right? It's actually 100 milli arc seconds um, and a little bit further away. Now, if you compare this to the theoretically expected limits from, from photon noise, we are still about a magnitude uh, short of that limit. And we think that this is mostly caused by some charge migration effects on the detector. Um, maybe also some interpixel capacitance, but it requires uh, yeah, some, some more work to be able to understand in detail what's going on and hopefully get closer to the, the theoretically expected limit also with this aperture masking mode. And for me, the, the plot that uh, really shows the power of this, uh, this mode is basically this one here, which is comparing uh, this aperture masking mode with the NERCAM chronography uh, at a roughly the same wavelength. Um, so this would be the, the purple lines for aperture masking and this uh, reddish lines for, for chronography. And you can see that inward of about 300 milli arc seconds or so, um, aperture masking is just giving you a lot better contrast than the chronography because um, yeah, JWST is six and a half meters. So it's actually quite a bit smaller than the biggest ground-based telescopes. And the chronography is kind of technology from 15, 20 years ago. Um, so it, it's... Uh, 
it's uh, not giving you such good inner working angle. And this is really where aperture masking can help. And if you look at the, the limits uh, in mask that we believe we can achieve around some of the nearby young moving group targets, um, you can see that we can, with this mode, really probe into the, the regime of exoplanets of a, a few Jupiter masses. Um, and what's really interesting there is we can really probe the, uh, the regime about maybe a few AU out to about 10 AU or so, which is not accessible with NERCAM chronography, and which is actually the regime where, where we think that most of these planets are forming and where we also think that these planets are most common. So these, uh, these observations will be uh, very helpful, hopefully to constrain different formation models of, of these giant planets um, by looking at some nearby uh, young moving group targets. Yeah, as, as Chris already mentioned, I'm also part of two uh, cycle one programs that are uh, using this aperture masking interferometry mode to observe known exoplanetary systems. Uh, the first one is on HD206893, the second one on the more famous uh, Beta Victoris system. Um, and our idea here is to combine observations that we have already done from the ground with gravity, which is an instrument at the uh, VLTI in Paranal. Um, so you can see actually here in blue the gravity K-band spectrum that we already have uh, of Beta Pictoris C, one of the planets in the Beta Pictoris system. Oops. Um, and if we combine that with photometry from JWST in the L and M bands, uh, which will be very precise, of course, because um, of the high SNR observation that we can get from space, then we can get some metallicity constraints, also some C2O constraints on these close-in exoplanets, and we can study if their atmospheres. Uh, dominated by methane or by CO, we can learn something about the subcellar LT transition. Um, and we can also study for the first time directly the presence of clouds in these atmospheres of really close in exoplanets that are hard to detect with the chronography, with the classical chronography uh, technique. And this hopefully will also serve a little bit as a pathfinder for these observations of, of planets in the young moving groups that can hopefully tell us more about the formation of these gas giants. So finally, I want to touch a bit on uh, integral field spectroscopy, uh, which we have also done in the ERS program. Uh, for this, we observed uh, the VHS 1256B, which is a, a, a low mass brown dwarf companion. And you can see it in this uh, little image down here. It has a duration of about eight arc seconds from the host star. So this is kind of a really easy case because it's such a far separation. There's not a lot of uh, residual host star light that is uh, leaking into our uh, observations of the companion. Um, so we were able to actually get this beautiful spectrum all the way from one to almost 20 microns um, of this uh, of this low mass brown dwarf at a really, you know, really high signal to noise ratio, um, which is, you know, putting everything, uh, 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 yeah, basically outshining everything that has been done before, before from the ground. And we can see some beautiful absorption uh, features there, for example, from methane, um, also some low vibrational lines uh, from CO, a very high detail in SNR, uh, in a way that has never been seen before from the ground. We've been able to, for the first time, detect a silicate cloud uh, or directly detect a silicate cloud in the atmosphere of such a low mass object. Um, and there's still a lot of work ongoing, of course, uh, to exploit the full information that's encoded in this, in this uh, really uh, broad spectrum over the full luminous range of this companion. Um, of course, ultimately, we want to do some atmospheric model fitting and maybe also run some atmospheric retrievals. But right now, the issue is just that none of the models that we have contains all these spectral features that we are seeing in this very rich and broad spectrum. So it, it takes really a lot of time for also modelers to you know, update their codes and um, you know, proceed with this analysis. But I think we will still see a lot of science coming out of this. Now, one, one major question with this is, of course, what happens if you go closer to the host star? Because this was at eight arc seconds, pretty far separation. Most of the known planets are just at a, at a uh, maybe an arc second or even below that. So the question is, how well will that work if we go closer to the host star? And what kind of PSF subtraction techniques can we make use of um, in these IFU data? And that's something that will be explored by different cycle one programs, also from some of my colleagues at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, so yeah, this is basically just a brief summary of, of what we have seen for JWST. So with chronography, we have demonstrated 
already sensitivity to sub Jovian uh, planets at wide separations. Um, the interferometry mode in MIRIS gives you better angular resolution and conography, but a, a slightly reduced contrast performance. Um, and then the spectroscopy is, of course, extremely powerful for atmospheric characterization, but it remains to be also to, uh, to be seen how well that works at, at smaller separations. Um, hopefully something we will learn in, in the upcoming cycle one observations. Yeah, so the, the next big step in the, the high contrast imaging of exoplanet field will be Roman, which um, yeah will hopefully be launched in a couple of years from now and for the first time uh, peer into the reflected light regime. So all the observations that I've shown you before with JWST are in thermal emission, wavelength longward of at least a micron, often longer than that, um, and basically probe the thermal emission of the planets. With Roman for the first time, we will be able to, to look at reflected light from those planets and also to study mature objects that are not as young as the ones that we have been studying so far. So for high contrast imaging, um, Roman will, will have on board this uh, CGI instrument. I'm showing here like a little bit of a architecture uh, for, for CGI and I just want to highlight a bit that Roman will basically also be a technology demonstrator for a future flagship mission that will try to image smaller Earth-like planets. Um, it's going to demonstrate for the first time wavefront sensing and uh, control with both low and high order wavefront sensing in space. Um, it will uh, do the same for deformable mirrors and also for these very low read noise photon counting EMCCD detectors. And with all of these uh, new technologies uh, that will be tested in space uh, on such a big telescope for the first time, um, it will then hopefully be able to uh, yeah, detect planets in reflected light. So this plot again here shows planets uh, separation versus uh, flux rate to the host star um, and shows here a couple of uh, known planets from RV surveys um, that, you know, some of them Roman might be able to detect directly in reflected light. And that's also for reference just shown um, what would Jupiter look like at a separate, uh, at a distance of 10 parsec. Um, and that's maybe something that also is doable with, uh, with Roman CGI. There's a paper from one of my collaborators from Europe, Oscar Carion Gonzalez, who has shown that basically two dozens of the already known exoplanets should be detectable. Uh, with Roman CGI. There's a lot of gas giants among that, of course, but also some sub-Neptunes, and I think even one uh, super-Earth, uh, one very nearby super-Earth, which could in principle be observed with, uh, with Roman in, in reflected light. And yeah, just for reference, up here is the, the planets that we've been seeing so far in thermal emission. So it's, you know, as you see, another three orders of magnitudes uh, in contrast that we have to go until we get into the reflected light regime. Um, so as I said, Roman will basically be um, kind of a technology demonstration also for this uh, future NASA flagship mission, which will maybe be launched in the 2040s and which has been kind of discussed by the recent Astro 2020 decadal survey. Um, and one of the main or key science drivers behind such a mission is the direct detection and characterization of uh, potentially habitable planets around nearby stars. So this... Uh, little image here, I think uh, Rosé also worked on that, shows uh, how observations with such a telescope of a hypothetical uh, solar system at a distance of 10 parsec could look like, and how you would see planets like Venus, Earth, some zodiacal light, and also Jupiter. Um, and then the idea is, of course, to uh, ultimately get some spectra of these, uh, uh, at least of the planets in the habitable zone that we are finding, and to study them for some different molecules and uh, ozone, uh, water, oxygen, and maybe find some science uh, science for, for life on these worlds in the spectrum. Uh, this plot here is from one of Chris Stark's uh, yield estimates papers and basically motivates a bit this uh, off-axis uh, telescope design um, by yeah, showing that it can actually give you a higher uh, yield, a higher number of detected exo-Earth candidates um, because, yeah, you have uh, less diffraction from the secondary mirror and the secondary support spiders and so on that you would have in the on-axis configuration. So in chronography, you can get a better, better contrast performance and that helps you to get a higher yield. Um, so this is kind of the one of the concepts that maybe uh, NASA will go forward with, but we will see, of course, in the future. Now, one of the, the main issues for such future observation of Earth-like exoplanets 
um, is so-called exocytical dust. Um, so if we look at our own solar system, we have uh, this so-called zodiacal dust cloud. If you go to a, a very dark place like Paranal Observatory in Chile, you can actually see this zodiacal light with your naked eye. It's kind of a, a bright disk in the ecliptic. Um, and this is basically yeah, from starlight reflected off those small dust particles. Um, there's also a thermal light component to the zodiacal light. Um, and we, we think that it's kind of, um, yeah, the, this dust is basically quantity replenished by collisions of asteroids or comets and or little comets in the asteroid belt that are then spiraling inwards towards the sun um, and basically causing this, uh, this uh, cloud of dust with a surface brightness of about 23 magnitudes per square arc second. Um, and uh, of course, this will be some additional astrophysical source of noise if you want to detect these uh, very small Earth-like exoplanets also in other systems, because we also think that other exoplanetary systems should have similar um, zodiacal dust clouds, and we then call them exozodiacal dust. There's been a, a, a survey called the HOST survey, which was also um, supported by NASA, and which basically probed around the, some of the nearby sun-like stars for the amount of exosodiacal dust um, to kind of get a consensus of how much dust we would find on average around these uh, sun-like stars. Um, and they kind of found a median of about three zodis. So here one zodi is defined as 22 magnitudes per square arc second. And it's basically um, the, the amount of uh, dust that you would see if you, if you observe the solar system uh, from outside of the solar system. Um, so they found a median of about three times that much and a 95% confidence upper limit of about 27 sodis. But as you can see, there's also a couple of systems which actually have pretty high sodi numbers in the you know, several hundreds of sodis. Um, and uh, one of the questions that we were asking ourselves together with Chris is basically, um, these yield estimates that people have done before have always assumed that you can subtract this exosodiacal light down to the photo noise limit. But of course, in your observation, it will be a kind of a resolved source because it's usually this within a disk. It might have some kind of inclination. It might even have some resonance structures or clumps. And it's not really trivial that you can subtract such a, a noise source down to the photo noise limit. And we basically wanted to investigate if that is feasible or not. And for that, our approach was to really do a full end-to-end -end simulation uh, and simulate uh, hypothetical observations with such a future mission um, of a solar system at 10 parsec with zodiacal dust, different SODI levels, different inclinations to find out if we can subtract the, the component down to the photo noise limit or not. So we developed this um, coronograph simulation tool, uh, which is uh, based on some high fidelity PS, uh, coronographic PSF models that we got from industry partners. Um, so this is basically just showing you how one of these coronograph designs um, for, for Louvre B, uh, the PSF would look like. And then we would base, basically use this model and convolve it with our astrophysical scene um, to simulate realistic observations um, of uh, exoplanetary systems. And this is what we get in, in these images here or these videos here. Uh, you can see um, the solar system at a distance of 10 parsec and an inclination of 60 degree, um, the top panel so on the, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see our scene image. So what we would actually expect to see in the observations with such a future mission. Um, and then the other three panels show the components from the star, the different planets as they orbit the whole star throughout time and the zodiacal dust component. And then the top is for one Zodi. And you can see in that case, it's actually uh, very easy to make out the planets, at least as, as, uh, as if they are in, in gibbous phase kind of behind the star and you see a lot of reflected light from them. But when you go down to um, about a hundred Zodi or so of dust, it actually becomes a lot more difficult and you need to have some kind of post-processing to remove this zodiacal dust component. Um, also, uh, our simulation tool is available on GitHub. And if you wanna play around with that uh, or get involved, feel free to yeah, get in touch and reach out to us. So how, how do we make the planets visible? Again, we use a very similar approach to what is done with JWST. Uh, we, we simulated some uh, role subtraction and some reference star um, subtraction techniques. Um, for the role subtraction, we use two different role angle, one of 10 degrees. So that's again, what JWST can do right now, but also one hypothetical one of 180 degrees because we were thinking it would give you more or better, better symmetry properties 
and that would help you to um, yeah better subtract the, the, the exosodical dust components. So these three images here are showing um, uh, yeah the solar system at 10 parsec again after you do the reference star subtraction. So in this case, we assume an ideal reference star that doesn't have anything around it. It's just a star, basically. So once you subtract it, you can, of course, see um, this zodiacal dust component with the forward scattering part at the bottom and the backward scattering part that's a bit fainter here at the top. Um, and the two bottom ones show the roll subtractions. Of course, in that case, you also have the zodiacal disk in both images at a slightly different roll angle. So you get some self-subtraction from, from the disk if you do this roll subtraction. And you can see if you use a small roll angle of 10 degrees, um, you subtract parts of the disk that are more similar to each other. So you get actually down to a, a lot uh, less flux or yeah, residual uh, flux than if you do the 180 degree roll subtraction where you subtract very different looking parts from the disk from each other. And so you get this very strong um, residual, uh, anti-symmetric residual of the, of the zodiacal disk. Now, how do we get rid of the disk? Uh, we took a very simple approach and simply fitted a, a parametric model uh, to this disk uh, over, the, over the whole scene, basically, to make use of the entire uh, amount of photos that we collected on, on the exosodiacal dust disk. Um, so this is here the, the models, the best fit models uh, for our parametric disk. Uh, in this case, of course, here we, may, may, we make a parametric model that describes an anti-symmetric uh, residual structure. But then again, we simply fitted that to the entire image and subtracted it from the image. And then you are basically left with the detection of this injected Earth twin at quadrature that you can see either here or in the role subtracted images. You can, of course, see it twice, once positive and once negative from the, from the, from the role subtraction. And now the question that we were asking ourselves is, uh, how close uh, do we get in these uh, images on the, uh, on the left, on the right hand side to the, to the true photon noise? Or is there actually some additional systematic noise from an imperfect subtraction of the zodiacal light that is kind of um, adding some additional systematic noise to our observations. And this is what is shown in this figure here. Um, so we made simulations for both Louvoir A concept and the Louvoir B concept, which is a bit more similar to what has been recommended by the Astro 2020 decadal survey. And these plots here basically show as a function of the exosodiacal dust level. So we start at one and go out to about 1000 sodies. Um, how close do we get to the photon noise limit? Because the y-axis shows the ratio of the noise that we measure in the images to the noise that we expect uh, based on photon noise. Actually, the logarithm of that. So if the plot is at zero, it means that we do achieve or we do get down to the photon noise. If it's at more, at more than zero, it means there's some additional systematic noise left after trying to subtract off the exosody. And you can see that if your system has a, a higher inclination, then you kind of start to deviate away from the photon noise uh, limited regime faster. And also if you have a telescope that is smaller, or if you observe similarly a more distant system, um, you would also start to deviate away from the photon noise uh, limit more, more quickly. But the kind of the good news is, um, as you can see, usually be below about 20 sodies or so, we are fine in basically all of the cases that we simulated. And as we have seen before, the host survey found that the, the median Zodi level is only about three Zodi. Um, so the message is basically that uh, this exosodiacal dust shouldn't be too much of an issue for these uh, observations of, of Earth-like exoplanets. Now, of course, one uh, remark I have to make here is that in this case, we simulated smooth exosodiacal dust without any kind of clumps or resonant structures. Um, and uh, one of the next projects that is done by one of Chris's uh, new students is basically to look into uh, what happens with a, an exosody that also has some resonance structures or, or, or clumps, and if this will have uh, also an impact on these, uh, these observations. So yeah, I'm getting to the end of the talk. This is basically the last slide. Um, I just wanted to show you another result that we got from these, um, um, yeah, uh, uh, disk subtraction exercises. So basically we wanted to figure out if it's possible to um, find the inclination of the system by uh, trying to fit a model to this exosodiacal dust component of the image. Um, and um, this uh, plot in the middle here basically shows, we, we did a couple of different simulations um, and we used uh, basically a uniform prior in cosine i on the inclination of the, of the model. 
And then we just simply fit that to the data and see what was the best fit inclination that we found for, for, this, for this image. And as you can see, um, as we have, a, so on, the, on, the, on this side here, we can see the different SODI levels. And as we go, uh, as we have like low SODI levels at the top here, it's really difficult to constrain the inclination uh, just from those, um, from those uh, fitting exercises. And only as you go to uh, SODI levels of a few tens up to a hundred or more, um, it becomes actually possible to retrieve the inclination um, from our simple parametric disk fits. And this is of course, um, uh, yeah, a little bit bad news because we were hoping that we can find the inclination from the, from the disk, because it's very important to figure out if we detect a planet, what is its orbit? And for that, it's very important to know the inclination of the system, to know the best possible time to re-observe or to spectroscopically characterize the planet. But of course, we also just use a very simple parametric model here. And maybe you can come up with some more sophisticated models that uh, make it easier to kind of retrieve the inclination from, from um, the zodiacal dust disk. But at least it's not as straightforward as we thought, as, as we thought because the coronographic PSF is basically just blurring out uh, a lot of the the yeah the structure of the SODI and it's becoming really difficult uh, to fit for for the inclination and yeah with that I'm at the end of the, the presentation I'm going to leave you up with my uh, three take-home messages um, so in the beginning of the talk we have seen how JWST enables for the first time really the detection of sub Jupiter mass exoplanets and also the characterization of these uh, objects over their full luminous range, which I think is going to be really transformational for the field of exoplanet characterization. We have also seen that JWST offers a very versatile suite of instruments for high contrast imaging. Um, each of these modes sensitive to like a slightly different parameter space and targeting a slightly different science. Um, and then in the end of the talk, I've been basically showing you some simulation work for the future NASA flagship mission. And we have seen that exosodical dust will, uh, yeah, hopefully or likely not be an issue for observations of such future Earth-like exoplanets, at least for the low SODI levels that were found by the host survey. And yeah, with that, I'm, I'm at the end of the presentation and I thank you all for, for joining uh, either in, in here or online. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Great talk, Jens. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, so if anyone online has any questions, please raise your hand or you can post them in chat. And of course, anyone in the room is welcome to ask questions. I think we do have one online right now mm -hmm. from Trouble. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Thanks, Joe. I, yeah, yeah, it's just great talk. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just, um, ask a couple ones that are uh, maybe um, especially relevant, I guess, to the exozody portion. And I think the things I want to ask about that are maybe linked to. So for the host survey, that was LBTI. So that was uh, mid infrared um, constraint. So how do you model that for if, example, if, for example, you want to figure out visible light near infrared observations? Is there, you know, is that something that you think there's a pretty good handle on in terms of modeling that? Something I'm not, you know, I, I'm not really knowledgeable about. I, I can do it, yes. No, I can't. Okay, yeah, just so there's not as much feedback. <laughs> question you're totally right the, the host survey was uh, was with lbti and basically studying in the mid infrared um so for for the simulation that we have done here we basically didn't do any kind of investigation of how those mid infrared observations would translate into near ir reflect reflected light observations we simply um, assumed the the zodi levels that they were finding the amounts of the dust that is present and then we use one of chris's simulation tools to basically just simulate the amount of reflected light that you would expect from a dust cloud with that amount of dust. Um, but we, we didn't do any further investigations whether, um, yeah, how that projects between the mid-infrared and the, the, the yeah. mid-infrared vision. And I think, you know, and obviously getting visible and near-infrared, uh, you know, so exozody values, that's something I think a lot of people know is important to do down the road. So I think that's not, um, that'll be interesting to see. And it's kind of linked the other thing that I want to ask um, because it's awesome to see the kind of this work being able to do the detection. Did you do any initial passes on if you have an IFS, um, how does, 
extricating the exozoty affect potential spectra? Uh, yeah, that's uh, something we haven't looked at yet. We have for this only focused on basically uh, observations at, at 500 nanometers. Um, but it's something we can look at. We have been putting a lot of effort into making this coronal graph simulator fast so that we can simulate also basically a whole spectral data cube. Um, so yeah, that's something that we certainly want to explore in the future, maybe also for the, the project with uh, Chris's new student working on the, like the non-smooth zodies. Um, and also what you were saying about, uh, yeah, detecting the, the reflected light component of the exosodrical dust is very important. I totally agree with that. There's actually also a science case for, for JWST aperture masking um, to try to detect zodiacal light in some of the nearby systems. But of course, that's also going to be in like the L and M bands, so not really in reflected light, but I think it might still be relevant for this. Yeah, yeah I think an L and, M, L and M like data points would be awesome, right? Relative to like N band or something like that. Awesome. Thank you, Jens. No worries. Thanks a lot. Right. Any questions in the room? We have a couple of questions in chat, but I want to go to the room next. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry. I was uh, yeah, right. sorry. <laughs> but so the question was basically for the for the zodiacal dust whether it would be helpful to have um, observations of or have polari polarimetric information of the observations. Um, so that's also one thing that we haven't explored yet uh, with our simulations. Um, and I'm I'm not even sure. I think in your tool it doesn't simulate polar polarized light, right? Um, but of course I would imagine that if you can get access to polar polarized uh, intensity that would be helpful for these observations. Um, I mean, we have also seen that uh, in other observations of exo, uh, of uh, yeah, photocellular emission, it's basically where polarized light is uh, a lot easier to detect those disks in total intensity. So my guess would be that, yes, it will help if you can have access to polarization, but it's something we have not, not explored with any of our simulations. Uh, and there's a question in chat um, that says, when applying the reference star subtraction for your uh, zodiacal dust simulations, are you computing the flux scaling factor for the reference data using images, or are you assuming perfect prior knowledge of the stellar fluxes for the science and the reference stars? Right. So what we do is basically, in this case, we assume an ideal reference star. So it's basically exactly the same brightness as the, the science target. Um, the only difference is that we use um, kind of a temporal evolution of the of the wavefront. So we have different speckle fields. But in the the, the, the physic, astrophysical properties of the reference are considered to be like an ideal reference star. So we don't really have to do any scaling between the fluxes uh, because yeah, they're simply assumed to be the same. And something that is also worth mentioning here is that of course this is kind of an ideal boundary scenario. And especially um, if we get down to these really high contrasts of Earth analogs in the habitable zones, we think that probably most of the stars in the sky actually have some sort of structure around them, maybe either a zodiacal dust cloud or even some planets. So it's going to be pretty hard to find a good reference star. And um, that's why maybe the role subtraction uh, case is the one that is a little bit more realistic and deserves a bit more um, investigation. Hi. Uh, any other questions in the room? <laughs> so I was interested in like you basically highlighted a lot of open source Is that been a focus of the activities that you've been doing the last few years? Because periodically run into something like an open source repository called Internet um, by the center. And you haven't seen a lot of tools submitted actually for Yeah, so the question was basically about the, the, the online data reduction tools that we have been developing. Um, and uh, yeah, so this has been part of the DRS team mostly because for the DRS, uh, that was kind of part of the, the proposal was basically to make this accessible to everyone and provide some data reduction tools to the community. And so this is what was one of the main reasons why we had to develop this. Base pipeline basically, um, and and 
yeah, I mean, we, we have that. We are we are thinking on the one side to maybe integrate it into the official JWS data reduction package as well. But of course, if there's other um, opportunities for that, we are free to take it. It's not a software repository. We would also be happy to, to host it or announce it there. Um, and I think the same is probably true for the Solano optimization team that is developing this script. So we are always happy to have other people um, helping us and getting involved with the collaboration as well. Uh, and then I think the last one we have time for, um, John Chambers wanted to go back to the IFS slides. Please, so, John, was there a specific question you had on the slides? It's actually the one before that. I wanted to uh, uh, take a closer look at that to see if not no, one more up. One more up. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe it was the next one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the one right before that. Right before this one. Yeah. The one that had the diagram of the. Uh, Oh, the uh, they actually had the exoplanet in view. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. They had the uh, they had the target. I just wanted to uh, uh, take a note of that so I could read more about the observation. Great. Thank you. No problem. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Otherwise, uh, we will be grabbing lunch if anyone wants to join. But again, Jens, thank you again. For, I, I can't clap. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, everyone online, for coming out today. I'm going to end it here.